Tonight's demonstrator is Stuart Batty. And uh, on behalf of Rocky Mountain Woodturners and everybody in our group, I want to thank him personally for, for coming up and, and doing an awesome, what I know is going to be an awesome demonstration for us. Stuart? Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for being here tonight, folks. Um, I'm just going to do a demonstration on simple ball turning, which is side grain ball turning. Um, I mentioned before in the piece that was brought up the critique that was that was end grain. Uh, I just spent uh, two weeks in Hawaii where they make a lot of end grain bowls and uh, that that's for a different history. So in general terms, we don't want to make side grain bowls because there's a lot of complications in making a side grain bowl compared to making, uh, sorry, making an end grain bowl compared to a side grain bowl. So side grain bowl is spindle turning is simply anytime the grain is running the length of the bed, which is, you know, a pencil, uh, a pen blank, you know, balustrade. So when the grain is running this way, it is spindle turning. When we spin it this way, in general, we, it's ball turning, egg face plate work, whatever you want to call it. But this is where we have a, a different kind of wood turning technique. And the reason for that is in spindle turning, you're either on side grain or you're on end grain. But when we're ball turning, we're on mixed grain 80% of the time. And mixed grain is very different. It's a much more different material to spindle turning. And that's why back in the day when my dad was a production turner, he was a production spindle turner, and his ball turning technique was not spectacular because he didn't make balls for a living. He made null posts, balustrades, uh, and things like that. But, um, and there was those that were production ball turners, but production ball turning to nowadays, or if you're doing it for a hobby, is simply we want to in general be turning a side grain ball. So in fact, what we've got is a pencil, we spun it, and what we've got is what I call mixed grain, end grain, side grain, end grain, side grain per revolution. So keeping that in mind, that's where a lot of the problems come from. And also there's a problem that the grain isn't fully supported like it is all the time in spindle turning. So in spindle turning, when we're cutting into towards the center of the lathe, we're cutting towards the center, is the fibers of the wood are in our favor. But in ball turning, they're not always in our favor because of the, the direction that we're cutting in. Um, but let's just, I'm going to go back to my uh, seven fundamentals. Those who have taken the class from me before, I've seen me demonstrate before. I do have what I call my seven fundamental setups. So the, I call them my seven setup rules. And I just want to uh, clue in on these as I go along, especially for those of you who are new. So we're wood turners. That doesn't mean we don't turn polymers, plastics, and what have you. But when we turn those, we don't have to deal with grain. Uh, they're a different problem altogether. And one thing about turning plastics, because I've just been turning a lot of plastic recently, is every type of plastic is a different nightmare. Wood turning is way better than plastic. I don't care with your turkey turning Delron or you're turning PVC. They have huge problems. And also, I noticed that I got a little bit sick from it. If you turn enough of it, and I turn hundreds of pieces, is they gas off. So you have to wear a different kind of respirator because this kind of mask or an N95 doesn't work because it's a gas, it's not a particle. So I was affected by PVC. So be very careful with that stuff. So what we're dealing with in wood turning is we have grain. That's the number one thing in wood turning. That's why it's number one of the list. The second is chucking. Chucking is important for two reasons. The most important is if you don't chuck it right, it's coming off the lathe and it's coming at you. So chucking is extremely important because we don't want to get hit by the blank ever, if possible. And now there are times when you're going to make a mistake and it's coming off the lathe. So we'll cover that a little bit later on. Three is a sharp tool. Now, I've been a production turner and professional instructor of wood turning now for exactly 40 years. So I became a professional turner at the age of 16. I didn't want to be a production or a professional spindle turner or whatever. My dad says, because I wanted to be an architect, he says, well, now you're 16. How about you come work for me for one year? And at the end of that year, you'll have a ton of cash. And then you can go off to college and not be the broke kid at school. And I says, what, you're not going to pay for all my fees? My dad says, hell no, you're going to earn it. But you know what ended up happening was I made so much money because I got faster at turning. At the end of the year, I'm like, man, I don't want to go back to college seven years to become an architect in the UK, all the debt that went with it. And we, we don't have debt from school, but we have debt from housing and living in general. So anyway, so um, going back to this is grain, chucking, sharp tools. So if you don't have a sharp tool, it doesn't matter how long you've been turning. I've been turning as a production professional turner for 40 years. I can't turn any better than you with a dull tool. Fourth is the tool rest. It is not a hand rest, guys. You guys stick your hand on it all the time. 
It is not a hand rest. I'll explain why. If you grip that tool for certain cuts, it destroys the cut. It is impossible to do a good cut. You just use the tool rest momentarily. Otherwise, forget about it. It's just for the tool, not for your hand. My dad called it a hand rest. And he used to bug me. I said, dad, stop calling it a hand rest because then my students grip it thinking it's a hand rest and it ain't no hand rest. Okay, number five, lathe speed. Now, unfortunately with lathe speed is we need fast enough to cut efficiently. When you turn the lathe slow, really slow, it makes the tool aggressive. But then when you turn it really fast and it comes off the lathe and you get hit by it, you're going to get seriously injured. Now, you can watch some professional turners turn pieces this size and larger at crazy speeds. Do not mimic it. Not even if you're wearing a baseball, batcher, you know, baseball catcher's helmet. It is not worth it, guys. The maximum speed we ever attain on the outside diameter, so if the bow blank gets bigger, the speed gets slower, is 40 miles an hour. So I'll show you what that looks like. And you should stand in front of the lathe going, that's running fast. But if I keep turning the speed up, you're like, I don't want to be in a room. It's too fast, guys. I've been in demos, watch people demonstrate at speeds that are just way beyond it. Over 120 miles an hour, a square ball on a tenon without a tailstock. Suicidal, guys. It is not worth it. This is a hobby. Even as a professional, I don't want to get injured. I never turn that speed. They do it because their technique is not as good as it could be. They're doing it to make up for bad technique. Do not do it. It isn't worth it. Okay, the next is where do you put your feet? So stance, really important. Stance. And then seven is technique. Technique is how do I control the tool to make the shape that I want? That's all it is. It is just technique is tool control. So I get the, the cut from end to finish in one path. It's very few times in wood turning, only the inside of the ball is the only time in wood turning that I would move my, no, do I even move my feet? I just changed the gouge. No, nope. on the outside of a ball, even if it's 24 inches, I'm doing it in one pass. I am not somebody that works a shape, works a shape, works a shape. I just go for the shape. It is actually easier in the long run if you learn a technique. So the style of turning I'm gonna show you tonight is called push cut. It has been around for over two, two and a half thousand years, the way I am turning in Europe. I did not invent it. I did not come up with this idea of any crazy thing. The only thing I've given to wood turning is a certain grind, two certain grinds, and negative rig scraping. A negative rig scraping, I didn't invent it. I just gave it rules so you can use it on a lace because my dad could never have used negative rig scraping. Why could my dad never have used negative rig scraping? He could never have learned it, never have used it. Spindle turner, but what did he do with his chisels? He honed them. Can't do it. So any chisel, it doesn't have a burr. So if you see somebody selling a carbide negative rig scraper, it's BS, guys, because if it's carbide, it can't make a burr. It ain't negative rig scraping. And my mistake that I made with the name negative rig scraping, does anybody know what the, what the mistake I made when I called it negative rig scraping 20, 25 years ago? So they called it negative rig abrasion. It is not scraping. It is abrasion. So it's a form of sandpaper. And that's why it's very effective, but it's also lousy. So it's a good and bad. We'll talk about it a little bit in this, but be careful with negative rig scraping. Why you got to be careful with it? Not because it's dangerous, because it isn't dangerous. Why you got to be careful with it? It's addictive because it gets you out of a whole bunch of trouble when really you shouldn't use it. You should just stick to the gouge and only use it when you have to. Okay, so I'm going to prep this blank. Uh, now, the position I'm going to prep it in is not ideal. Just because it's not ideal, that means I'm going to start slow and I'm going to prep it to make it ideal. I can't make it ideal the way it is. Now you could say, oh, I could put on a face plate. My problem is I teach too many classes where I turn up and if I ask somebody to bring everybody to bring a face plate, plus a drive center, plus a drill, plus a screwdriver, plus the screws, <laughs> it ain't gonna happen when I turn up. Sometimes I turn up and I look at the wood they prep for the class and I go like, so we're turning firewood today, guys. And I mean, I mean, literally firewood. I'm like, you still gotta practice some reasonable wood. So the simple way to do it is everybody's always got a drive center, a live center, and a chuck. That's every workshop in the world now in wood turning. Well, maybe he's not Lyle Jameson. Okay, Lyle Jameson hates chucks. I have no idea why he hates them, but he can keep hating them, but we should love them because these are unbelievably good for us. And I did not have one as a kid. We had no chucks. So we were faceplate, glue chucks, everything but a damn faceplate. In fact, we did damn chuck. So chucks are fantastic. So to prep it, what I'm simply going to do is take my regular, what I call my 40-40 grind, and I'm just going to prep it real quick. Now, 
it's between senders. Is this ideal? No. I could make a faceplate and put some bolts through it and sharpen the bolts. There's a whole bunch of ways of supporting this, but a nice big drive center, no crazy speed, and nothing's going to go badly wrong. And I'm also not going to stand in front of it. So I'm going to start off slow. So give me a minute on this lathe. I have not yet started it today. There it is. So the maximum speed I want anything between centers like this is unbalanced. Even if everything is flawless, it's a thousand. And a blank like this, I can probably easily get to 900 and there's no problems. And at this speed here, there is just over 900. If I pull this tailstock off now, this ball blank will not go airborne. It will hit the floor. But if I take that to 1100 and I pull off the tailstock, the likelihood is going somewhere in airborne. So we don't mind the ball blanks going to the floor. It happens all the time. Somewhere in a class, somebody knocks the ball off. We want it to stay not towards our face. Okay, so here, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put my left leg forward as part of my stance. I'm going to use the wing of my gouge, and I'm just going to peel the surface down. This is not a finished cut. This gouge that I'm using right now is a side grain removing tool. This is side grain, but it's not a side grain finishing tool. But I'm using a side grain removing tool because I need it level. I don't care about the finish. I care about getting it flat because it's band sewn. Then I'm going to make it fit my bigger jaws, which I believe these are, they look like four and a half inches. So I'm going to scoop out once, twice. Now I was going into side grain, but leaving end grain behind. I don't want to push on that end grain. I spin my gouge and cut the other way. So I'm always cutting side grain. Now I'm going to take a little scraper. I just got a little boring old 10 degree scraper. Let me just put it in front of the camera. It's just 10 degree angle. Hold on. 10 degree angle on it, which matches the dovetail on my jaws. So I'm going to expand into a dovetail. This is not a fun, easy cut. It's, well, it's easy, but it's not fun. Just pushing in, scraping. Just a little undercut there and enough space for the jaws. That's it. So that's how I prep my blanks for my ball turning. Depending on how many balls I turn tonight, depending on what you guys want to see, I'll give you an option later, is to that. Now you see, so you see the finish, abysmal. That's because the tool I just used is the world's fastest removing side grain tool. It is not a side grain exposing tool. It's an end grain exposing tool. I'll show you that later. If I want side grain finishing tool, I choose a different tool. Just like in spindle turning, we have spindle gouge, which is a sp an end grain slicing tool. And we have a spindle roughing gouge, which is a side grain peeling tool. I'm going to use two versions of this in my bowl turning. I'm going to use a bottom bowl gouge and a 4040. So this is like the spindle roughing gouge, and this is like the spindle gouge. So I'll show you what the difference is in a little bit. We'll come back to that. So using similar technique, this blank is ready. I'm not, I guess I should just throw this one on the lathe. I was going to do a slightly bigger one. I'll do this one first. We'll get going on it. No, nope, I won't. So I, we'll just get going, because I don't. I, we've, I've got an hour and a half, so I've got limited time. So I got to get flying on this a little bit. So sorry, I'm getting a little confused as to which I was going to do. I was going to do the really big one and then do a dry one. But I think I've got to be wrapping up by around about uh, 8.30, 8.45 by the latest, because you guys are going to clean up my mess. Unfortunately, this stuff is right where it shouldn't be for me. And I'm on the inside of the bowl. That's where all my chips are going. So I'll try and aim them lower, because you have an option as to where the, where the chips go when you're turning on a, inside of a bowl. So I'll just not make them go too far. So I'm setting up right now um, a video recording studio. I'm a little bit late to the game. This one's mine, so I want to make sure I take it home. Um, I'm a little bit late to the game on um, remote demos. You know, everybody went to remote demos, and I have not gone to remote demos. I've only done one for the AAW. Otherwise, I haven't done it. So, but I'm setting up a recording studio right now. And I really put some thought into it because I set up a recording studio before. When I say recording, I mean a video recording studio, not a sound recording studio. I set up one before and I produced a bunch of videos, which are free on the internet. If you go to vimeo.com slash woodturning, I'll write that down in a minute. Then you can see I have many hours of free videos, but they weren't the fully educational ones that I intended to produce. But I, I was waiting at the time for higher resolution cameras. At that time, the cameras I was using, I remember I put it somewhere safe and I remember where I put it, um, were just 1K cameras. Now that I've been able to purchase uh, 6K cameras and then I can record and edit in 4K means I can get really high resolution. 
because there's a lot of subtleties to wood turning that I'm going to try and portray a little bit tonight. But I'm going to what I'm going to record is a series of videos where I show you the correct way to turn and then how to fix the errors that everybody made. So I've done enough teaching now. I've, in fact, I've actually done more teaching of wood turning than anybody in the history of mankind. So in my dad's era, when they had a master turner teach, he never taught more than 20 students a year. So I can teach 20 students in four days. You know, I get 10 and 10. And I've been doing this for, you know, for 40 years. So nobody in history has done that before. So I've done more teaching uh, than any other wood turner in history. Uh, but through that, I've seen all the misinterpretations of what I show somebody. I call it like the goldfish bowl effect, which is I show somebody, you know, my five, six, 10 students that are around the lathe. I show them a technique, one technique, one little this cut. And then they walk away and it takes about seven seconds to get back to the lathe. And then they completely forgot what I showed them. That's like the, the, the goldfish effect. You know, the, the goldfish swims around the bowl, takes seven seconds to get back around. It's a new view because it's got a short memory. And it goes off back around again. People are just the same, super short memories. So I'm trying to create videos where you get to see me make a super easy, everything going perfect bowl. But then for every little stage, you see, well, which one did you do? Did you do the correct one? Or did you do this screw up, that screw up, this screw up, that screw up? Oh, I did that one. How to fix it and how not to repeat it. So that's what I'm doing. So it does, it, is it much more difficult to shoot than you think? Because all of a sudden, instead of shooting a one hour video for a one hour bowl project, it's now five hours of shooting. Five times the editing with eight cameras in 6K. Each camera produces 550 megabytes per second of memory. Tom knows this because I shot one for him just recently and we only shot in 1K and that was a nightmare. So we're shooting eight cameras in 6K. Okay, anyway, uh, you'll see why they'll be, they'll be released starting next year. Um, but the one thing I did do, I completely built a studio where all the cameras are on the ceiling and all the cameras are on circular tracks. Because you can't, I used an XY system originally when I first did it with my, with my cameras on the ceiling. It doesn't work. I need to be, everything's focused on a central point. So using circular tracks means you can move the cameras and get all these positions that you guys get a much better idea of seeing it live. But if when you're watching purely on camera, you really lose perspective. That's the problem. So when I'm teaching class, like at Craft Supplies USA, I teach a class there once a year. And they always have the students sit in like tiered seating and tell them to watch the monitor. And I'm like, hell no. If you watch it on the monitor and then go back to your lathe, you will not be able to mimic what I just did. You have to watch it with your eyes. Here we've got the compliments of both. But if this was a real class, this is not a real class. This is a demonstration. If it was a real class, I would encourage you not to ever watch the monitors. You've got to watch the Turner because you get a, we have so much information of how we stand in perspective. As soon as, even though we've got, what, three cameras right now, it still didn't give you perspective. If you watch everything on the screen, it's really confusing. But you have, you have the ability to watch me live and then glance at the screen to see close up. That's very good. In a class situation, I just say, hey, just crowd around the lathe. Especially, this is the optimum place to be looking at the same view as I've got. That's how we learn. Okay, now I'm on a chuck. I'm going to retighten it just to be on the safe side. Just make sure I'm expanding, not contracting. This is the top of the ball. I'll hollow that out later. So expansion is stronger than compression in the case where I have lot, lots of material. Compression is stronger on the bottom of the ball because then I get the bigger diameter, crushing it down rather than a smaller diameter, pushing it out. But in this scenario here, this is perfect. Even though I'm on four inch jaws and I'm super secure, I'm still keeping the tailstock there. It's just safety. I cannot tell you the amount of times I teach a class where somebody turns the ball down to the round and then they just do six balls in a row, down the round, down the round, down the round, six times just to get it down because learning this cut is tricky is the amount of times where they take the tailstock off and the ball falls on the floor and they go, ooh, I forgot to tighten the chuck. No, they tightened it the wrong way. It happens so many times, at least two out of 10 students do it at least once. And so think about it, if they didn't have the tailstock and they tightened onto the scrap in the middle, which is this bit, and often it's smaller, it would just snap off. So keep that in mind, really important. If you've got a tailstock on your lathe, I'm gonna cover this up is use it. Okay, um, by the way, if you're gonna get ash, you know, somebody said there's an ash tree coming down. So I'm very familiar with ash. Ash is extremely common in the UK, much more common than it is here because it's native to the UK. 
The problem with ash in Colorado, it's very different, even though it's just possibly the same species as the UK, because this is what we call olive ash in the UK. It's got a dark heart, looks like olive wood, and it's got the lighter sapwood. So most of the UK trees are like this. We don't have the pure white trees. It's always got an olive heart. Is ash cracks so fast. You cannot turn the outside of the bowl and then take a lunch break and come back and turn the inside. It will have already cracked on you. It cracks in Colorado that fast. So if you turn the outside, either put some wax on it or rough it out immediately or throw a bag on it, um, because especially because it's spinning as well, that even amplifies it more, the, the dry air spinning. So keep that in mind if you're turning ash, is it's very unforgiving. You know, elm, even honey locust, hours before it cracks. Ash, Tom watched me cut some ash this morning, and then he heard me cuss. And I'd only been cutting for 20 minutes, and I was cussing because I hadn't wrapped up the first blanks 20 minutes earlier, and they'd already cracked in 20 minutes, fresh cut. And so anyway, keep that in mind if you're going to get some of that ash. Okay, so let's take this down to the round. So I'm going to use a 40-40 grind. I'll show what it is, and I'm going to go for a slightly larger gouge just to get this down to the round. Okay, so this is a big problem we have in wood turning is you could bandsaw this down the round and make it really flawless, and that's okay. But then if you bandsaw it down the round, then you're wasting wood to get it more down to the perfect round. So instead, I'm just going to take a piece where I've just taken the corners off like this, and I always have my students do the same, and get it down to the round without getting beaten up. And the reason that you're getting beaten up is two reasons. Either you're off the bevel or you're on the bevel too much, one or the other. Or if you're having a really pleasant time, you're gliding the bevel. We don't ride the bevel. The, I don't know whoever came up with the term rub the bevel. The person that came up with the term rub the bevel was maybe he's doing it as a joke. Maybe they say, I'm going to screw up millions of wood turners for the next hundred years. You can never rub the bevel and be successful in wood turning. It is an impossibility to rub the bevel. As a spindle turner, I can't ever rub the bevel. I can never do a pummel. That's a square this, the, between the square and the round. If I rub the bevel, I can never cut a pommel. You glide the bevel. The bevel is barely in contact with the wood. It is in contact, but if you put any pressure on it, any pressure, one gram, it will bounce and it will beat you up. And I'm going to demonstrate that right now. So I'm going to do the perfect cut with no energy going to what, into my body, no vibration, none of that garbage. Ooh, I've got to watch. I've got to start a little slower. This lace is moving. Okay, I'm going to go slow and I like. If I'm going to go slow, I'm going to go left-handed. So all I'm going to do is just glide the bevel. All I'm doing here, this is really slow, as you can see. That's me gliding the bevel. No vibration back to me. I can take a big bite. So what I'm doing here is I'm lining my bevel up. And the bevel is really small. Where's my pencil? Here we go. The bevel's really small because I shortened it. I don't know if, if that comes up on the screen. Does it come? Let's see, I've got a short nose on there. So it's a secondary bevel. I'm going to pass one of these around in a minute. So it's 40-40 grind. So the 40-40 grind is I'm using the bevel, which is short. I'm gliding on it and using the wing to peel and the nose to slice. It's a double action cut just to get it down to the round. Once it's down the round, then it's easy. Okay, so let's demonstrate what happens if you rub the bevel. And I actually hate doing this part of the demo because it beats me up. So if I take my thumb and I push on that surface, I mean, you try, and then you say, well, I'll just push harder. It'll just beat you up harder. The harder you push, the more it fights back. This is wood. You can't win the fight. The only way to make it work is by letting the tool glide on the surface. See, just gliding. No vibration back to my body. I'm still using the bevel. I'm not off the bevel. I don't have the bevel pointing this way. The bevel is pointing parallel to the cut, and I am just leaning from one side to the other. And all my left hand is doing is adding weight to the front of the tool. It is not controlling the tool. It is not pushing it in. It is not pulling it off the surface. It's simply letting me glide the tool on the surface. At the end, I want to slow down because the resistance of the wood will go down and I don't want to burst through. So we just peel through that last little bit. So that's cutting it down the round without me getting beaten up. And oh yeah, no torn grain. I don't know this thing about torn, who gets torn grain here. Anybody get torn grain? Once well, I've heard about it. My dad told me that people get torn grain, and I believed him when I saw some other people turn sometimes. So torn grain doesn't. Anybody ever take my class? We don't talk about torn grain in the class because nobody. Any quite a few people have done my class. Do we have torn grain in the class? No, we don't have torn grain because we just because the grind. 
It's nothing to do with the technique so much as it is through the grind. Is we want to slice and peel. And all we talked about, and I said, oh, you got a little bit of torn grain showing up. They say, oh, yeah, time to sharpen. That's the only time that we, we have torn grain with push cut. Remember, we have the ability nowadays with modern sandpaper, like ceramic sandpapers, even diamond sandpaper. Do you want it? We've got incredible sandpapers. I remember growing up as a kid, garnet sandpaper was like magical stuff. Now garnet sandpaper, like that's, that's like cheap stuff. We don't use that anymore. So we have incredible sandpaper. So people like my dad, they had to be able to turn with carbon steel tools, not high-speed steel tools, underpowered motors, lightweight lathes, and get a great finish, and then not have to sand it much. So the torn grain is a modern phenomenon. It is not a, it is not a phenomenon from um, old times. People in the old days, you have a look at an old balustrade, you know, on a 100-year-old house, there's no torn grain on a balustrade. If you look at a modern one that you buy from Home Depot, there'll be torn grain on it. Automated, yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, I'm going to knock this drive center because this one's really sharp. It's one of those ones that would do some serious injury. So, and I'm going to put it inside here, guys. Do you remember where I put it later? Okay. Now, I, I'm a big fan of long bed lathes. Okay, so because this little workout that I got to do several times today is more than I like. <laughs> And I know you can get swing aways and what have you. Swing aways are okay. Swing, some swing aways work good. But swing aways slow you down. And I'm a I come from production turning. So I often, I just spent two weeks in Hawaii teaching product, professional turners to turn faster. So I always tell them, just get a bed extension. Don't put it on the floor. Don't swing it away. Don't swing it down. Or the one at 45 degrees. No, no. Just get along a bed. Don't deal with it. Because the problem with the swing away is they're magical until one chip gets in there and you swing it back and it locks and it locks and it locks and then you got to get open it again blow it off put it back you've already half a bowl missed lost so i i taught the guys at andrew pierce bowls so the production turners at andrew pierce bowls when i first went there there was three turners and they couldn't make more than seven thousand bowls a year three turners couldn't make more than seven thousand bowls a year how many bowls do those three turners now make from seven thousand and all I changed was the grind. I, they already had good technique. I changed their grind from the Irish grind to the 40-40 and the bottom bowl gouge. Two gouges instead of one. So I went to two gouges with Siona says, isn't that going backwards? I brought you in to make them faster, but you're giving them two gouges instead of one. And I says, yeah. So how much faster are the guys? Went from 7,000 between three of them to how many bowls now? 26,000. So that's a bit faster because what did I eliminate? Their sanding time. They were taking 47 minutes a bowl. Now they're down to about 16 on average. And an average bowl is 13 inch. So it's all to do with sanding is, there's several problems with sanding. One is it's really expensive because sandpaper isn't cheap. You know, one sheet of sandpaper, you're not buying a sheet of sandpaper for 10 cents. It only costs 10 cents to sharpen your gouge on CBN. So sharpening a gouge for the last cut is way cheaper than starting at 80 grit, 120 grit, then to 80, 180 grit, because you've already spent you know, way more money on sandpaper. Okay, so we got down the round. Let's flatten it off. And I think it's speed up a little bit. I, I want to get to about 1,200 on this bowl, but it's, it's not like it on this floor. There you go. It wants to take off. So I'll get it, down, get it a little bit more level. Let's find out where there's some imbalance in the piece. So again, this, this gouge does not give me a good finish on this cut, but here... I flatten it off, then I cut the corner off. Let's get the, ball, the bark off. Now the bark, you'll remember what the bark does to the gouge is it dulls it. So now we can move the tourette. So I only move the tourette from one to two positions and then knock off the corner. Then I move it for the third position. Now with push cut, you want the tourette closer to the bottom than the top. If you set it at 45, you've predetermined to make an ugly bowl because there's nowhere to start the curvature. So the gouge, remember, doesn't cut in this direction. It cuts it 40 degrees off. It's a 40 degree bevel. So we set it off by 20 degrees towards the bottom. And I say 20, it's just a guess. Okay, so from here, I'll take a little bit, of, get a little bit of shape because I do want more speed. Like I said, in wood turning, we want, ooh, this lady does want to take off. Isn't that amazing? No, that's so good. I'll just get going. Once I get some of the mass off, it'll be fine. It's just, with it being slower, I have to cut slower. Just 
cutting fluid here just to get some of the mass off. And then I'll talk about the technique. So just need to get the mass down. So there's maybe, you know, more sapwood on one side of the bowl than the other. So this is push cut. I'm pushing around with my right arm. I have no body contact with my handle. What I mean by that is I don't have my body touching the handle, only for straight cuts. The straight cuts, body contact, straight cut, body contact, cut the corner of straight cut, body contact, and no body contact. Or you do definitely have a little bit of a different heart system than here. So that's maybe where most of the imbalance is, but also a little bit more sapwood there. So let's see if we can get the speed up. I just want to get up to just over a thousand. Right now I'm at 800. Oh, there it is. Woo! I see, now I feel good. All right, makes a big difference. 20, 200, 200 more revs on a bowl like this. So this is push cut. Is I'm holding the end of the handle. And you might think, well, that's a bit weird. He's pushing all around. Why, why don't you just pull around? Well, the problem with pulling around like this is if I take any volume, I destroy the fibers. So right here, you see the lifting of the grain? So how do I get that, those fibers to get not torn? I have to take less and less and less and less material which means I got to go over the surface many times to get my finished result, but not with push cut because push cut says, if I can take three quarters of an inch in one pass, that's what I'll take directly to finish. So I could take really large cuts like this. So here I'm taking just half an inch. I'm not going to take more because I'm on the high speed pulley right now. Oh, that's a, that's a lift just vibrating a little bit there. So I backed it off. So you can see, I took two fairly large cuts. They're not finished cuts. I have no torn grain, and they're not even finished cuts. I'm just hogging it off right now. So how do I control the gouge? Well, this is probably the hardest cut to ever learn in wood turning. And, and coming from a spindle turner, there are no particularly difficult cuts in spindle turning because the cuts are really short. You know, a bead is half a bead. A cove is half a cove. A V cut is half a V. Then you do the other side. It's always two cuts to make a shape. You know, so if you're doing a curve, you do one side, the other side, one side, the other side. You bead, you run one side, you roll the other way. You're going across the end grain, one short cut. This is a very long cut, and you're on mixed grain. You got knots, you got sapwood, different densities of the grain. So you can even hear it in the wood if I turn this down, and you'll hear it clicking on the wood. Yeah, thump, 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 thump. So that's the bevel rubbing going soft, hard, soft, hard, four times per revolution. So if I was doing 1,250 RPM, which I don't think I can get to on this right now. Ooh. There we go. Yeah. Let's see what we can get. Bigger cut. Okay. So this is push cut. Just simply, my left hand is only pulling the tool down and stabilizing, not controlling in any way at all, not blocking the path of the tool. This allows me to push around the bowl, gliding on the bevel. That's why it has to be 40 degrees to slide on the bevel. If you go to 50 or 60 degrees, it will not slide the same. And it interacts with the end grain. We don't want it to interact with the end grain. We want to expose the end grain. So if that, yes. No. Um, so there's a flute parallel to the floor. Let me just show you. So if you can pick it on camera, I'm just opening enough to, to throw the chip. Just enough to throw the chip. That's all. If I open the 45, I'm cutting a little bit towards uphill into the end grain. Could you imagine if I cut vertical, what would happen? I'd get a catch, wouldn't I? So I don't want to go towards the catch area. And it's not that you can't go to 45, but I'll actually, because I'm cutting more of the wood coming down instead of the wood in front. You see, I'm cutting the wood in front of the cut, not the wood coming down to the edge. I'm actually pushing through it. Correct. In fact, the tip is the only part that's giving me the finish. And all the, the, the actual wing is doing is removing the wood and throwing it to the floor. So that's what I said before. Look what my wing did on this side grain here. Can you see it? It messed it up completely. That's where a bottom bowl gouge comes in because that's side grain. This tool likes to eat side grain and put it on the floor. It does not like to finish it. It is a side, it is an end grain exposing tool. And this one, if I can find it, my bottom bowl gouge is a side grain exposing tool. Two different tools. That's why when I went to Andrew Pierce Bowles and Andrew Pierce says, hold on, the gouge we got right now, he says, we use only one gouge to do the inside and the outside and everything. And I says, yeah, and it takes you 47 minutes to make a bowl. And I says, but you use two and you get it down to 15. He goes, but that's an oxymoron. I says, no, no, no. 
You've got the perfect tool for exposing end grain and you have the perfect tool for exposing side grain. This is what, this is what spindle turning is. Spindle turning is bottom bowl gouge. They look the same, you see? Just one's bigger for spindle turning because you want to knock off corners. You can't use this on, on a bowl because it's too aggressive, okay? But they're the same tool. The only difference is this one has a slightly duller angle because of when it's using inside a bowl, if you used a 40 degrees, it'd be a little bit too aggressive because of the, the amount of overhang. And also, it's, uh, you can't get round the corner in the bowl. You, you'd be hitting the rim of the bowl before you got the middle. Then look at the spindle gouge. So this is a spindle gouge. If you're doing detail, fine detail, it's got a 40 degree bevel, round tip nose. They look the same from the back. But from the front, you can see that this one has a deep wing. Oops, I can hold it still. Stay still. This one is a deep wing for the peel. So it's peeling and throwing the chip out of the way. This one's just a bit more pointy to create detail. We don't need detail on the bowl. Simple as that. So these are the two tools that I use the most in spindle turning. And no, we didn't use the skew for everything. I know my dad's got a whole video. You can watch on YouTube if you type in Alan Batty. And he's got a two hour video on the skew. And then you can watch Alan Lace has got two videos on some of the skew and something else about the skew. And then all the people are skew. Guys, honestly, you, you have the saying here in America, we don't have it in England because we don't have any handguns. But, you know, it's like taking a knife to a, to a gunfight. So I remember racing my dad with, a, with a, my 40-40 gouge against the skew. It was a slaughter because there's just no way taking off material directly to finish can be matched with this because the skew is a slicing tool or if it's laid down flat, it's a peeling tool. But it isn't doing both at the same time. This is doing both at the same time. It's the only gouge and only tool in history of wood turning that does both at the same time. There is no tool that can slice and peel volume directly to finish. The bottom bowl gouge can remove a bit of volume, but it can't do anything on end grain. It can only do it on side grain. So in bowl turning, <laughs> there's barely any side grain. So, you know, this does like 5% of the work inside the bowl. Otherwise, this does all the work. So let me just show you what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna peel off the bottom here because I'm making it a bit pointy. Let's shorten that a bit. So you can see this tool is really good at getting rid of the side grain. It's really fast, but you'll see that it doesn't leave a good finish here, but it does there. See the difference in the two finishes? But let's use the bottom bowl gouge across the bottom there and show you what that does. Because the bottom bowl gouge, let's go with a different handle. Uh, is a side grain exposing side grain peeling tool. So this one, shoulders produces a nice big chip. So you can see across, I'm a tiny bit low. It's true, it's a little bit stiff. There we go. Get the height. So you can see very different animal. It still re can remove a lot of volume. Now, would I have bothered finishing the bowl there at this stage? No, I'm just getting rid of material. So it doesn't tear out the side grain. Okay, so let's do, what I need to do is, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna finish this one nicely, put a 10 on and pass it round. I'm gonna take one and screw it up. Is that okay? Cause I, I haven't got a full here to screw this one up and then fix it. Let's do that. So let's save them. So I'm gonna go for a finish cut. So I'm gonna pass around now two gouges. One is an elliptical flute and one is a V flute. So if you were buying an American made gouge, that would be Carter, D-Way or Doug Thompson. That would be a V gouge, that's the black gouge. The other one is a Canadian tool by One Way that has an elliptical parabolic flute. So one is, they're still both Vs, the former Vs, the parabolic is still a V, the elliptical is still a V, it's the same type. And then the V, and I'll draw it on the board in a second. I'll pass this round uh, I'm going to pass around a different one because I'm going to keep that one. I'm going to pass around a Sorby, British one. Okay. And I'll pass around, I'll pass them around together. You can see that they have exactly the same profile from the side, but they look different. And that's just the shape of the flute that makes a difference. So the black one is the V gouge. The one with the wooden handle is the elliptical parabolic. So anyway, that's the 40-40 grind that uh, I developed uh, to be able to do faster spindle turning cuts. But then I end up using other ball. Okay, so what I need to do now is touch up the gouge and do the finish cut round. So let's do that now. So uh, we're just gonna do a quick touch up on here. I'm not gonna go too much into grinding right now, but to grind it, what I would do is, obviously if I had a handle on it, I would be standing more 
where Hoyle is there, but I, I have the ability to take the handle off. And I'm just going to do one side. So I just drag it across by dropping, 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 and then rolling through the middle. That's one side. And then I do the other side. I just go across, dropping, dropping, roll through the middle, and that's it. And then I just take the heel off on this one. That's it. Make sure I got it. Yeah, I got it. And that's it. That's all it takes to sharpen it. <clears throat> it takes a little bit more to make it from scratch, but I'll cover that in a few minutes. But let's do a finish cut on this, put a tenon on and pass around the ball. Then I'll use one to mess up. What kind of CBM wheel is it? Let's ask Tom. It's Tom's grinder. Okay. I think about 350 is, is ideal for touching up a gouge. I think the problem with 600 is really easy to sharpen your tool, go back and go like, oh, doesn't feel any difference because you missed a tiny spot because it takes off so little. The 350, you can also do that with the 350, but we don't want to be using 80, 180 for our gouges because, you know, this is a consumable, but you'll be consuming it really quick. Especially I was teaching a class the other day where they had the 80 on the wrong side for us. And we were wearing down our gouges really fast. So we swapped them around because I said, we're going to burn through a gouge so quick. But if you're using like a 350, that's really good. And then keep a coarser one to the right. Tom's left-handed, so he's got them the other way around for how I would normally have them, but Tom's left-handed. He normally grinds his 40-40 on this side, and his bottom ball gouge on this side. And I flicked them around today, and I swapped them just simply for, for me. I'm, I'm right-handed. Okay. Um, but CBN is the way to go, guys. If you don't already own CBN, it's probably one of the best investments you can make because you're not likely to wear one out. It, even worst case scenario, five years, if you're a professional turner, it'll last you. If you're an amateur turner, it could last you 20 years. But aluminum oxide, more dust in the air, doesn't give as good an edge, takes off more material. Great for shaping, but not great for final edge. Okay, so what we're looking to do here is to get a finish cut on here all around. And I guess I should change the shape a little bit. And do I want a little bit? Just trying to get past that harmonic. And the one thing I do need to do is the wood hasn't dried in the last 10 minutes, but it's definitely compressed. So let's see if we can get an extra squeeze on this. Yep, a little bit. And let's go for a finish cut. Okay, now I'm not gonna put any shape on the bottom of the bowl that's the finished shape. I'm, I'm just cutting at an angle, shape the bowl at the top, and then I put a tenon on the bottom and then I reshape it later once it's dry. So this is just a rip out bowl. But even though it's a rip out bowl, I'm still gonna do a nice job to let you guys see what can be done with the cut. So I find the end of the cup. So I've got my left leg forward, my left, right leg back. That's for all curved cuts with push cut. Spindle turning, bowl turning, doesn't matter. When we do curvature, you always have your right foot forwards because I'm going to reach over. And let's take a reasonable bite. So I'm cutting a little bit slower because it's a finished cut. I don't care about how much volume I'm taking, but I do care about how fast I'm cutting, how fast the lathe is going, and how open or close my flute is. So that double is gliding on the surface, not riding. I don't know if you can hear me accelerate and decelerate the tool a little bit here and there. There are certain times where I get a little bit of vibration and I slow down and start the cut up again. I'll talk more about that when I mess up the cut on my next one. And I'm making this an enclosed bowl. And then we'll put a tenon on here. So I can use the same gouge for tenon because its included angle is 40 and 40, which is 80, which means I can grip it on this tenon right now. And just as a tool, I got a little bit of a blip there, but I'll leave it in. I'm not going to take that out. That would sound out. But normally I don't intend to get that, but I didn't realize I've got a little blip. Ooh. It's stuck. I'll pass this one round. But the main thing is, you'll see, you'll feel two marks. And I got a couple here, more than I'd like, but hey, but I have no tone grain. That's the important thing because two marks come out with a tiny bit of sanding, but tone grain does not come out because you've got to sand below the whole surface. Thank you. Okay, and I guess this is the one I'm going to mess up, the little guy. So I'm going to put the, the different kinds of marks or texture you can end up on the surface by rubbing the bevel. And I actually think where those marks were, I had my hand a little bit far forward on my gouge and I touched the tool rest with my hand. Remember, it's not a tool, it's not a hand rest, a tool rest. Okay, so let's be sensible. 
Rana Chuck, it's really strong, but I'm going to be standing in front of it. So I'm going to throw the tail stock on just for a second. Whip this down the round. Oh, and that dropped, didn't it? So normally, as you know, guys, not our favorite type of drive sender for wood turning in general. It's um, just too pointy, you know, like one with a ring sender on is much better for us because what you can end up doing here is, you know, you bury this in here and then you finish the ball a few months later after it's dried and you're trying to turn this little black dot out and you keep trying to get rid of it and get rid of it. It's because the mark is left and then boom, you go through uh, the uh, bottom of the ball. All right. So now remember we put a fresh piece on we don't know the imbalance so modern lathes are great we can do this i grew up with lathes where we never got the magic speed right because too fast too slow there's no variable speed now i'm going to again i'm going to go back to doing this left-handed because i don't like actually eating the chips oh come on this lathe is really uh, this is a great lathe i mean i have a big large powermatic at home um, but just it's on concrete and it's just a little springy on this floor. So again, I'm roughing it down a little slower than I'd like. I'd like an extra 200 RPM, but I can't get it. So I just realized I'm going to stick all the shavings back there, aren't I? So again, sliding on the bevel, not riding on it, just sliding on it. And now I can get rid of the tail stock. So again, it's just a safety thing. It comes from teaching a lot. Personally, myself, you know, I don't always leave the tail stock there if I'm doing it left-handed. But if I was doing it right-handed, then I would have been standing in front and I don't know what's going to happen initially on the first cut. You never know. Uh, then I will simply uh, bring up the tail stock. And because I've got a long bed lathe, I never put the tail stock on the floor. It just doesn't hit the floor ever because I don't need to. Okay, so let's fire off the court, this surface. Remember this cut here? Not a finished cut, just getting it flat, corner off. So as soon as you get the corner off, hopefully I can get the speed up just a little bit more. And what I'll do is use this one to show you the different kind of mess ups you can get uh, with push cut because push cut is a skill based cut. It is not, I'm not saying it's easy to learn. It is not. First, you've got to get the grind right. And then you have to practice this cut. When I teach a class with this, all we do is we do this on at least six, eight, 10 balls in a day. That's all we do all day, one day. You just turn the outside, turn the outside, turn the outside. The next day we do insides. That's how we make it work. Okay, so it takes time to practice. So let's just get it roughly to some kind of shape and then let me mess it up. I'm a little closer. There. So all that imbalance is obviously where the bark is. It's just enough bark and sap would create a little imbalance. Let's get one nice long cut in there. And then we'll mess it up. Okay. How do the chips get inside my mask? I'm wearing it, but they still get inside. They get inside your glasses and everything. Obviously, at home, I normally wear a face shield. But with a face shield, I get a lot of reverb from the mic and things. So, Okay, so let's talk about what I'm doing here. I'm taking the tool, and I'm sliding it on the bevel. So, in fact, let's just draw the tool up here, show you what it looks like, and show you what I'm intending to do with the tool. So the grind is what I call a 40-40. And that is referring to this one. It has straight wings, or relatively straight, tight V nose like that. Now it could be V, a true V gouge like this, true V, little radius at the bottom, or it could be an elliptical gouge, which is like this. Now I prefer the elliptical because it's easier to sharpen. Um, but the V is how what you get from certain manufacturers. Um, I can live with both, but this is easier to sharpen, easier to learn to put the 40-40 on because we're not very good as humans at joining a straight line here on a V gouge to the curve. We're just lousy at it. That's how it's going to be. Okay. And then obviously that's our wings back. That's our bevel. 
that's what it looks like. So straight wings, and then the 40 degrees is the 40 degree bevel. That's the included angle that's doing the work. That's the cutting edge there, that's 40 degrees. And then from the wings upwards is another 40. So the two together equal 80, which means the nose is slicing 10 degrees before the wing is peeling in there. Does that make sense? I'm actually getting my finish on my surface before the wing comes in and throws a chip on the floor. So I've already got a nice clean cut surface. So the opposite to that is to when you see somebody like, I'm just gonna get the chips out of this mask. Cause I'm now I'm swallowing them and they are pretty bitter. Okay, okay, so the two ways to cut this, the most turners do, and I, and I, you know, I'm, I'm good friends with Mike Mahoney, but anybody know why Mike Mahoney pull cuts? Anybody know why he actually pull cuts? There's a different reason for it than technique or anything else. There's a certain reason. No, no, I, I don't mind because, you know, he's not as fast as me, so it's good. I, I like to beat Every time I race him, I like to beat him. It's, it's kind of fun. He's left-handed. So he likes to use his left hand to pull it round. And I like to use my right hand to push it round. And that's all it was. And it took me, you know, I worked with Mike in the same workshop for months. And I'm like, uh, you know, we watch each other turn and Mike tries it. And he says, nah, I don't like this cut. He's like, I like what I'm doing. But I said, but now you've got, he's got four gouges. How does he do the inside of the bowl, by the way? Does anybody know how he does the inside of his bowl? 40-40, bottom bowl gouge. Because there is no other better way on the inside. On the outside, you've got options. But Mike Mahoney also starts at a higher grit than me, as in like lower grit, as in like 80 grit. Because he can't, you'll say, I can't get as good a finish but I get the option of being able to, when I flipped it, to turn it from the chuck uphill left-handed. And he does it left-handed from the chuck upwards. I don't have that option, I can. Once I get it in the chuck, if it isn't running true, I've got a problem. So he doesn't have that problem. He gets it running out of true. He just trues it up again. Okay, so let's show you what goes wrong with this cup. So first of all, how am I gripping the tool? Well, there's two ways to grip the tool. Anybody that puts a hand in front is already toast. It's almost impossible. I'm not saying it can't be done, but if you're gripping over the top like this, you're preventing yourself from being able to twist the tool because it starts over there and comes around here. And that's very uncomfortable to hold. You might think, oh, I like my hand on top to press down. There's a problem when we press down as we do this. Everybody that presses down, presses in. See? So the only way to stop it bouncing is to put your hand on the back of the tool to keep the bevel light. But now I'm going to keep my elbow and my hand high all day long. And if I get tired, I relax it. As soon as I relax it, I get the bounce. What does the bounce look like? Well, let's show you the bounce. Okay, so let's show you what the bounce looks like on a ball. So I'm going to do it with my thumb rather than my, well, I should do my palm. It's even easier with the palm. Whew, it's a biggie. Okay. I'm taking an old pen. I've trashed too many pens doing this. And it should make a wave. Oh, there it is. See the wave? It's always a wave. A wave, a wave, a wave. Not so much on the other side. Anyway, so what's happening? Well, we've got soft side grain here, then hard end grain and soft side grain. Notice there's no bounce in that area. The bounce is on the end grain. So what ends up happening is as you push in, you could hear that little clicking, clicking. The nose of the gouge is moving in and out. And so is the bevel. The whole gouge is moving in out. So the nose starts to cut a little bit in, and then it gets pushed out, and it cuts in a little bit in and pushes out. So it's like a wave. It's a, a trough and a crest, a trough and a crest. The problem is then your gouge has to drive over that bouncy surface. That's like a, dry, a wishbone dry you know, uh, road is once your car starts going over it, it doesn't make it better. Every time you drive over it, it gets worse. That's why it gets worse at the end of the cut a little bit of bounce, out of control. And a lot of people say, well, you're just not pushing hard enough. <laughs> it's only going to get worse. So what am I doing when I'm controlling the tool? Well, let me show you what I'm doing as a professional turner and anybody else that uses this technique, and we all do it as spindle turning, is if I start to feel the bounce, is I control it by cancelling it and let the gouge sit on top of the surface to cut a new surface. So I can rub on that there, cancel it, cut into it, and keep going. Then I'm creating a new surface. But if I take my fingers away, you'll hear the bounce starts to come back. So I got it back. So now it's further up the bowl. 
And then we've got a new bounce pattern. There it is, big one right there. And there's more than that. I just can't see them as much, but there's, there's a couple right there and one there. So the same, same starting on, it's on the end grain. It's not on the side grain. And so you can see it now. So if I'm not, if I'm, if I'm rubbing the bevel, what's the other extreme of rubbing the, not rubbing the bevel, what's the other extreme? Scraping with the nose. So that's the opposite to that is trying to cut without bevel support. And that would be coming up by pulling it with my left hand instead of pushing it in, is pulling it like this. Now, can you get a nice, you can get, a, you can get the shape right, but I'm getting a whole bunch of ridges because the gouge is hunting for the surface. It's not stable. So although from a distance you might go, well, well that looks all right. But when you have a look at it, it's just thousands of ridges and they would be really hard to sand out. There's also a bigger problem with scraping where you're pulling the nose around versus over rubbing the bevel. What's the bigger problem that I just created myself? Have we realized I did to the gouge? Dull, instantly. So now I go, oh, and then I go back and it won't give me a good finish. So how many times faster does it dull by scraping than it does by cutting? Anybody know the number? One, 10, 20, 30, 30, 30 times faster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I pull around there, I might as well have cut around 30 times, but we never need to cut around a bowl 30 times. It only take, probably takes six cuts to make a bowl. It's not that many, but here's the thing. This is M4. I've also got 10 V. They all dull slightly, even in one cut. So here, I'm just going to touch this up because I dulled it. That's one side. That's the other side. Yep. Put it back in. Okay. So oh, I'll put a nice finish on this just to prove that I can do it. And then I'll get the other one back because I need to hollow it. Is it available? That, well, that has happened before. So I was demonstrating at Alexander Palace in London. So Alexander Palace is a really big woodworking show in London. So um, Craft Supplies Limited in the UK had given me my own booth. So all, all I was getting to do was get, kind of like getting paid twice. Because he said, you just do whatever you want in your booth. You just make stuff all day long. And then we'll pay you and we'll sponsor you. And then I get to keep what I make. So I'm basically just demonstrating what I like production turning. <clears throat> oh, I've got to get these dust, please. I'm, I'm chewing too many of these particles. Sorry. They're going right down my throat. <laughs> all right. I knew there's a reason I brought some liquid. <coughs> these surgical masks aren't as good as he. A full blown N95, but <coughs> yeah, I've eaten a lot of chips. Anyway, where was I getting to? Oh, yeah. So, anyway, I was, I was having fun making bowls all day long. And I remember I turned the outside of this bowl and it came up really well. And I was using a chuck in, the, in those days called a multi star chuck. And you had to swap the jaws around for it to expand one way, and you had to swap them around to expand the other way to contract. So I, I'm talking to the audience, you know, and I finished the outside of the bowl and I, I passed the, the bowl around and then I've got the chuck done and I said, can I have the bowl back? It never comes back. And I'm like, okay, guys, come on. I can't do the inside if you don't give me the bowl back. It's not worth anything. It's a solid bowl blank. You know, give me it back. You want to steal it. At least let me finish the inside. It never comes back. So I'm like, this doesn't make sense. So I have to start the whole demo again. And you can't even lose the crowd's, you know, the crowd's attention. They're like, well, this guy's an idiot. He can't even keep a hold of his bull blank. So anyway, about three months later, I'm visiting my dad. And, you know, I'm in his workshop. And I'm saying, oh, that's kind of shape I would turn. He says, is it really? And I look at it. And I says, hell, that is one I turned. He says, yeah, you gave it away at Alexandra Palace. I says, what do you mean? He says, yeah, you, you passed it round. I was at the back. I thought, well, I'll just keep it and walk off. So my dad had walked off in the middle of the demo. Anyway, back to this finish cut. So here's something you may not realize. Because it's an end grain exposing tool, it is unbelievably, I mean, I cannot, I mean, I just spent two weeks in Hawaii teaching professionals. These are really good ball turners like Kelly Dunn and some other, uh, Emiliano, I can't remember his last name, from Argentina. Make, all they do, these guys do is make balls all day long. And they really wanted to be able to master this cut because when I first went to Hawaii, and I was there two years ago, two and a half years ago. 
Every day where I went, I put a dollar on top of the lathe and I says, I'll bet anybody a dollar that you can't bring me a piece of wood that I can, cannot cut without torn grain. So if you can bring me something, I cannot turn it clean. If I get torn grain, you get to keep my dollar. So they were so excited. They brought figured mango, figured koa, ko, um, partridge wood, spalted uh, mango, and every time I could cut it without torn grain. And that, but the problem was they'd only booked me for hands-on demos on all the islands. No, so for demos, not hands-on. So then I left. So like, well, I saw the demo, but now I can't do it. So then this time they brought me back, but of course COVID happened. They brought me back to say, we want to know how you did it. So I spent uh, 14, well, 12 days turning, teaching just 12 days solid, teaching these guys. And they were blown away because they were sanding so much to get out the torn grain. So the secret to doing this is, Make sure you got the sharp, the, the grind right. So relatively straight wings, 40 degrees, 40 degrees, gives me a slice and a peel. So if I go part of the way around, you'll see what I'm doing. I'm slicing with the nose, peeling. It's tracking by itself. I'm making it stable at the front. If I stop, you'll see it does tremendous damage to the side grain. See the side grain? It's mulching it, but not the end grain. See, it's cutting the end grain before it reaches the side grain peel. That's the secret to it. So you can use other gouges. So oh, they can, surely something else can do it. Anything that can peel. So if I'm doing just a peel, let's just show you the peel. So if I'm doing like uh, Mahoney style, uh, uh, Alza style, I do just to do the peel, large volume. So I can remove a lot of volume, but I'm still lifting the grain. Here, there it is. See, there it is. Lifted. So what do you got to do to fix that? Well, you go, oh, I can fix it. I'll just use the same gouge. It's, it's okay. I'll just take a smaller volume and a smaller volume and a little bit smaller. Oh, and a little bit smaller. And it's like, okay, I'm going to be broke at this rate. I need to get rid of the volume. So the secret of this technique is just simply volume directly to finish. So let's just... So let's get this in one cut and I'll pass it around again, see if we can do it twice. And then I'll do the inside because that's the bit you want to see. So let's see how big a volume I can take. This gouge is a five eighths gouge. Let's see if I can take five eighths. Ah, no. So not a big fan of movable headstocks. So the vibration you're hearing here is not the, not the chuck. It is not the gouge. It is movable headstocks. And it's not thing wrong with a movable headstock, but that movable headstock has dirt between the casting and the bed. And they all make this noise. If I take that off, clean it and put it back, that noise disappears. I've done it every time. I've done this at least 100 times. I said, oh, before I start a demo, is I'll slide the headstock off, clean it, put it back in there. You don't get that vibration. That vibration is coming from every time that, because even when I moved here, when I came here tonight, the headstock was forward and I pulled it back. But no matter how much you clean that bed, some dirt gets in there. And so this beautiful, this is the most important part of the whole lathe connection is between this and the bed. That's where the, the flex comes. The two depart each other by a thousandth of an inch, a tenth of a thousand. But by the time you get from there to there, that's a lot of vibration. We have a, I work on a, I work on a the big powermatic, which has two locking bars and we've never moved it. We just don't move it. And then Tom's got a, a long bed, big mark, which is permanently bolted down. We never have that problem. It never occurs on permanently locked down headstocks. It only occurs on sliding headstocks. It does not occur on rotating headstocks either because they don't get dirt between. But nobody ever cleans this enough that they didn't pull it once and pull it back. You get a tiny bit of dust, that's enough. You can't make dust to zero by crushing it with that wrench. You don't have enough leverage. And so it just rocks that tiny bit. And that's what you're listening to here. So I can't take five eights on this. There's no way. You wanna... Well, you can hear it. It will dissipate in a second. It always dissipates when you go to a certain spot. I can still hear it. So what you'll see is vibration marks. So it's, I'll leave it as that, they're there. That's it. So you can take five eights, even with that vibration, you can hear. And we know it's not the chuck because I've used the same chuck for these same chucks for 20 years. Me and Tom have been sharing the ch same chucks for 20 years. We, and the big mark, we don't have that problem. But I'll pass it around. That was a fast cut, half an inch, five eights in places. 
no tone grain. There is tool marks. That's just from the vibration. And I'll pass that around. And we'll start on the inside of the one. So you can see there's the tool marks. They're not tool marks from the spiral. Because remember, there is always a spiral tool mark on the wood because that's what we cut, a spiral. But they're marks from a little bit of harmonic. And it's just that if I took that off, it takes five minutes. You've got to flip the headstock upside down, clean it off, clean it. And then you've got to put it back without getting more dust on it. Because just in the five minutes, you took it off and put it back. Some dust in the air, especially if you use an air hose, it's back on the bed. So keep that in mind about moving headstocks. I know they give you the, the ability to slide it off the end for hollow forms, put a bed here, swing more. But just remember, you've got to clean them once in a while. And I've seen sometimes where I've taken these and I've cleaned it up and it's made the whole towel completely black, paper towel. And sometimes I've had to scrub it with um, like a Scotch Brite. It's so dirty. And then the one that I think, Hoyle, did you ever work on the, the jet? It, so the jet lathe it's, it lives downstairs in the Rockler basement. The casting isn't flat. And so we stuck a piece of paper in this. So was it almost impossible to do the inside of the bowl, wasn't it? Yeah. The vibration was so, well, actually it was the outside. He was, he was doing some outside of the bowl. The vibration was so bad on a big jet. And everybody else was working on mini lathes to not have any problems because they got a fixed headstock. We lifted the headstock. We put a little piece of paper underneath and it disappeared because it gave it a locking point, a locking point, not dirt in the middle where it rocks that little bit. Anyway, can I get the other bowl? Oh, I've got it back. Thanks. So let's do the inside. So it just shows you, you know, small little things can add up because that's part of your chucking system. You know, if we look at on the seven fundamentals, you know which way the grain is, the second most important thing is to chuck it correct. The third is a sharp tool. These are in order of importance because if you don't know which way the grain's running, well, you don't know which way to cut for one. And the second problem is if you don't know which way the rain, grain is running and you use the wrong tool, whoops, and you forget the locking button on this one's there. That's different to my locking button. I switched the lathe on. So I don't know where it is. There we go. Getting used to using different layers. Um, so I'm going to sort out the chuck because these jaws are just a little bit bigger than the next size down, which is here. In a, I didn't measure it, so let's hope I'm lucky. Yeah, we should be good. Actually, that might even fit that. Ooh, I think that might fit. I might have been lucky for the bigger size. I'll go with the bigger size. Now, you don't have to be the exact diameter. You can definitely be, yeah, that's good. We can still use it. By the way, something that's important, you put the chuck down, pick it up, see the little bits of dust on the bottom of that? And I put that on there. That means my chuck's not running true, which means all that effort I put in to making the, the bowl nice and even and round and location and everything means I forfeited it because of one little chip on there. Same here, <laughs> blow that off. Let's put this on. And again, normally I'll use a tailstock. So let's see if we can bring that up in a second. So, but I'm just going to get initial pinch. So there's no way you can hold that up against the surface as well as a tailstock can. So now if I remember rightly, I want this to be, yeah, I got to hold that upright. I'll put that back. By the way, I'm open to any questions about what I'm doing and what have you. Look at all the dust in there. So tailstock, nothing can match a tailstock for, for the accuracy here, as long as you obviously they're not out of line. There is times I've seen lathes that are actually out of line. And unfortunately, these are machined as a as parts. So a friend of mine, he had his truck stolen. And in his truck, bed of his lathe was a powermatic headstock, not the bed, not the legs, not the tailstock, not the banjo, just the headstock. He'd taken it off because he moved it in two parts, his lathe, but parked in a gas station, somebody steals his truck. And he wasn't bummed about the truck. He was bummed about the lathe head that he got because he got really paid out really well, he said, for his truck, but he got peanuts for his lathe. And so he said, I got this nice, you know, lathe without a headstock and it was a powermatic. So somebody had stolen that from him. So, and then he said, so he spoke to Paramatic and said, we can't sell you just a, a headstock because you have to have a tailstock that matches. And then we don't know if it's been machined to match this bed. So machined is one. So you've got to buy the whole thing again. Okay. So tailstock's definitely going to hold it more accurate than you can. And you notice Tom, Tom, this is Tom's wrench. He got a little wider one. The one that used to come with the, with the big mark chucks was too narrow. But even this, sometimes you'll watch somebody like Ashley Harwood, she'll take a regular Allen key and use the leverage to tighten it. 
on modern chucks nowadays, you'd have no problems in there. Uh, you know, a good chuck. I'm not saying a hurricane chuck or the grizzly ones or whatever they are. They're, they're not the same quality, guys. I know they're 100 bucks less expensive and they look identical. They are not identical. I have never seen a hurricane chuck that hasn't failed yet. In all the workshops I've been to, two in Hawaii, the guys that bought the hurricane chucks, they said, no, nah, they sit in the shelf. They broke. So they look great and they're 100 bucks cheaper. There's a reason they're 100 bucks cheaper is the little key here that they slide on is unique metal. It's a very new brand of metal. It has to be both be tough and tensile. And that's extremely difficult to do in steel because they're two oxymorons to have that, to have an oxymoron, to have a tough and tensile steel. So they have a very unique blend. And so this steel is very unique. I don't know what grade it is, but in the, the cheap ones, they get damaged and then it doesn't work on the scroll anymore. So keep that in mind. And here's the thing about these thick mark chucks is Tom's got some thick mark chucks and I have as well. Well, I think we're at least 20 years old. Yeah. Yeah. They never wear out. Okay. Okay. So hollowing out. So when we go to hollowing out, the problem we've got inside a bowl is what shape have we actually got? Because there is no way you want to use a 40-40 gouge all the way to the middle, even if you can. It just doesn't work. And let's explain why that is. So if I draw and make a very nice deep bowl and close deep bowl like this. And let's put a foot on it so we know it's a bowl. Okay, so there's a deep bowl. That's bowl number one. Then we decide, oh, we're going to make the bowl this tall. That's bowl number two. Then we're going to do an open form, and that's going to be bowl number three. So, and let's put an interior wall thickness. So the problem we've got is getting to the middle on the very tall bowl, you can see is a different angle to the angle that we need. So if you look, you need to get your bevel in contact, so that's your bevel, and then you draw your angle up. That's a pretty steep angle there on that gouge. So that angle is from there, well, actually I did the arrow wrong, but from there to there, from there to there. And that would be, hmm, that's too high. That's about 75 degrees. So can that be cut with a gouge at 75 degrees? You cannot. The highest angle we can go to is 70. If you make your bottom bowl gouge 75, it just won't cut. So that's the time when you used to use a scraper in the bottom, that last half an inch. You just can't get your gouge to make it, so you pick up a scraper, scrape it out. But if we look at the next bowl, if we look at bowl number two, what angle is that? And this is probably the most common angle that we see in bowl turning, which is 60. 60 covers 80% of the bowl. So the green from there to there, that's 60 degrees. And then obviously you can see, well, hold on. I, I, the sh I'm doing, I make shallow bowls say, Well, you say, I don't need 60 degrees. I can use 40. You can, but the problem with the bottom bowl gouge, as you go around the corner, it doesn't like the end grain. So what we'll do with that is we'll show you why we use a, a bottom bowl gouge because the 40 40 gouge doesn't like the, the bottom of the bowl, should I say? Okay, so by the minute you can see the mess that the 40 40 makes on the face. Two options. If I'm going to shape the rim and do a fancy shape on the rim, then what I could do, I have the option of simply um, cutting in either direction. I won't get torn green. If I cut with a curvature going one way and a curvature going the other, then I can use my 40 40 gouge. If I'm leaving it flat, I can either take a small cut pushing in. Yeah, that is not running true, is it? Hmm. Okay, we'll be turning it up when I jam chuck it anyway. Okay, for some reason, not running true. I can cut across like this, but I'm actually technically cutting quite a bit of end grain. So a percentage of that cut was end grain. And sometimes it will give me a clean cut and sometimes it won't. And in this case, it's okay, but not great. I'm still getting tear up. So I'll say to myself, bottom bowl gouge. So why try? So I'll just fix it with the bottom bowl gouge later. Okay, so. All my cuts want to go straight in. The straighter I go, the faster I can cut. If I go in any, if I go in the large volume like that, you see the difficulty, the vibration? That's what happens if you go towards the end grain. So we don't go towards the end grain, we go to the side grain. So we'll get rid of it, side grain, side grain. Now at this stage, I flattened up the middle, but I have nowhere for my gouge to start. So I want my bevel to go in at the correct angle, but it won't go in the correct angle right now. 
So what I'm doing is making what I call a V cut. So I make space. So this cut here produces still a percentage of end grain, but in a minute, once I got enough depth, you can see my side grain chip there and my end grain chip there. So that's not ideal, but it will be in a minute. As I get deeper in, in a minute, I can bring my handle further round, further round. And now I'm getting almost pure side grain. And I'm gonna to change to a heavier duty gouge because I wanna be more aggressive. So it's just a stronger gouge, but I do want a longer handle. So ha longer handle, the leverage makes a difference. So I'm gonna to go to a 20, 24, I think it is, yeah. And let's be careful, this is just a two horsepower lathe. So what I mean by that is, you know, I can stall it if I take too big a cut. So going in straight like this, I end up with these really big cuts. And I can move a lot of volume. Sorry, guys. But you can keep them. Yeah. You got the same problem with your mask as mine. The chips are going down it. Yeah. So I'll get to a certain thickness. Sorry, unfortunately, the uh, audio equipment gets some of it too. Right, so a little bit deeper. So look at my grooves. I just, all I did here was left the grooves. So let's me put my gouge back in them to make more space. My gouge, I don't have that difficult start. And going in here, let's go a little deeper. And then start the swing again. Now this time the swing is a little bit earlier because I'm following my outside shape. And I'm using those ridges to help me out. There's definitely something in there. Let me just see what I'm cutting through. I can feel it. Oh yeah, that guy. Because yeah. there's end grain. What the hell? Where'd that come from? I was watching up front. By the way, all the action is, I know you all watch the action here, but the action's actually here. It's this arm that's doing all the work. My left hand is just a weight. I'll use it when it's a critical point to do an entry cut, is I'll bring my thumb right up front and lock it in. But right now, I don't have that issue. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. How to stop the skidding? Okay, sure. So the gouge starts almost flat. Almost flat, thumb on the tool rest, physically on the tool rest, not on the tool. I can get away sometimes with it not being on the tool rest, but then it'll slip a little bit. So right here. It's, and then once I'm into the cut and the tool is stable, I, my, hang, my fingers are now jamming the tool, which is not good. My fingers right in front, these are jamming. So you don't want this effect where they're jamming it. As soon as I'm inside, I twist my hand, open my flute and let it go forwards. And then I come around as far as I can, which is there. So I'm going to cover that again in a minute because I'm going to do it again, but I'm going to get rid of some of the middle and then I'm going to show you how to make it thin. So I will then we'll pretend it's a rough out ball. But I'm going to do, a, um, so I'm just going to demonstrate. It's a pretty piece of wood, but I can really feel that knot. I can really feel it. It's a little bit kick on the, on the cut. You can still cut through it. I mean, it's still... The knot is still partially side grain, but the way you're facing into it, it's a little bit denser than the rest of the wood around it, but it's a pretty piece of wood. Okay, so this is how the bottom bull gouge works. So the reason, well, let me go back to the 4040 for a second. The reason people don't have too much of a problem with this gouge on this area of the bowl is because when the gouge gets to the outside of the bowl, I can still be touching the lace, but that is not going to be the case with the front bottom bowl gouge. Nearly everybody that I've ever had an apprentice, professional, in fact, no, there's nobody, not any of my, any student ever has got this tool straight away, the bottom bowl gouge. Many, most students get this after two or three bowls. They get the idea, point the bevel in, swing around the corner, don't swing too late, you come through this wide, don't swing too early because you make it too thick. But everybody gets this one wrong, the bottom bowl gouge, even though it's an easier technique. The reason they get, wrong, get it wrong is for two reasons. One is they're gonna black block the tool's path 
and two, they're going to stand too close to the lace. So the end of the cut of this cut is when I'm back from the lace with my right foot forward. That's going to let me pick up on the cut where it started, where it starts from, and get to the middle. And there's a lot more swing from here to here than there was before. The other gouge only swung a tiny amount. When I say a tiny amount, it seemed like less. It went from there to there. But this one is going to start in the same position last one finishes, which means it's 20 degrees further around because it's 60, not 40. That's 20 degrees further around. And then it's going to swing not till it gets to the rim, but it's going to swing till it gets to the middle. So look at the amount of swing from here to here is about 90 degrees. If you don't allow the tool to do it, then you'll end up with the ridges because what you'll do is you'll be off the bevel and then the tool goes hunting for the bevel and you won't have control. It'll be aggressive. And so the idea is, be able to start and finish. That's why you must have the right foot forward, not your left. You might think, well, left's way more comfortable, but then I can't start the cut. So you have to have the right forwards and you have to be able to left back so I can get the middle, find the end of the cut. Now here, the tool's gonna kick a little bit, but I don't put my thumb behind because I don't want to push it a fulcrum in. I'm just gonna use, just using the bevel, the guide on here. So you can see it kicks at the beginning, so I've got to grip it, then release it. The reason it's kicking at the beginning is it's hunting for the bevel. So do you hear that little bit of bounce I had there? When I get a little bit of bounce, that means I'm pressing too much in front of the tool and rubbing the bevel. If I press behind, I'm scraping and it's kicking. So I've got to find that, that magic spot where there I've got it going, stay slightly above center, and then finish on center. Pick up the next cut. Lightly above center, down to center. Now I've got this little ridge in there. You can see it, little line. I can't get rid of it without the big swing now. So now I'm going to start up the ball, sliding down to my original cut, find the cut just before the ridge, and then continue through the cut. Just lost it there. So I'm going to go back and reset. So it's really easy, even for me as a professional, sometimes I'll lose the cut. And I'll reset it. See me, I'm resetting it. I didn't want that bouncing noise. And you heard the tool kick there a second. I didn't swing enough. When it kicked, it meant I didn't swing enough. My bevel came off and it, it went hunting for the bevel. So the finesse of this tool isn't ultra high and it's just side grain, but we still want to get a good finish across the side grain there. So we'll go for one more cut on that. So this time again, now the ball might have already warped because it's a wet piece. So you can hear it's already warped a little bit. So you don't want to follow that bounce. So I'm going to glide down and cut myself a new surface without the bouncing noise. But I haven't got it yet. There it is. Got it. I hunt for it. Make sure I've got it. Look how much I'm swinging at the rear. Swinging at the rear. Lost it there a little bit. Come back in. This wood's a little bit crazy. I must admit, I can feel it. It's not the easiest wood to turn. So and the reason it's not that easy to turn, it's a lot of hard and soft, dense parts. But you can still cut it. You just, sometimes you just got to back off the cut, pick it up again, back it off, pick it up without the ridges. So that's the ball finished as a rough out from there. So we got the options on, where are we on time? 13. I'll finish this one. I'll make this one thin. Okay, so let's do that and I'll jam check it because I've only got 15 minutes. So right at this stage, I would definitely uh, wax or glue this. I, I use the, I'm going to start using the Elmer's glue 50 50, which is Elmer's glue, use the, the, the regular wood glue, diluted with 50% water. It's better than the, um, the paraffin wax ones like the, uh, what are they called? Anchor seal. It, it flexes a little bit with the wood as it warps, whereas the anchor seal doesn't. And I have a friend that's been using it for about two years. He says he's never lost a bowl using the Elmer's glue 50% water. Uh, and it's pretty cheap. So you can buy it by the gallon. Uh, or in smaller containers, mix it up and it works really good. The other thing as well is obviously don't mix more than you need to at the time, uh, but also it doesn't, it's not affected by freezing weather. You know, if, you, if your anchor seal is left somewhere where it freezes, then it won't go back the way it was. So let's make this thin wall bowl and then I'm going to jam chuck it and turn the outside. So this particular time, I'm going to sharpen the gouge, but before I do, because I didn't sharpen for the inside, let's take this one off. I'm going to set myself a series of ridges. Then I'm going to cut it thin in one cut, not series of cuts. So what I'm going to do here is let's cut half the ball away now. A little bit more than half there. There's half. Just flexing a little bit.
I'm going to cut half of this away again. And I can make it to the middle. Maybe it's cut half of that away. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start from the outside and take half of this away, power through this next step, power through the next step, power till I get to the bottom when I'll close the flute. And what let me do is turn it down to um, thin in one pass. And then I'll make the outside really clean from the outside. God, somebody's making a hell of a mess in this place. Mm. I was thinking, like, when I came to that, I'm thinking, I'm pretty sure these are not in the optimum position for a ball turning. If I was spindle turning, you'd have no difference. But okay, something important. This cut's really important because it's gonna, this ball is going to try and escape the cut. And two, it's already cut several miles of chips. So remember, at 40 miles an hour, if that's the outside periphery of the ball, I'm cutting a mile of chips every 90 seconds. So every 90 seconds, the nose of that gouge, because remember the finish of my gouge comes from the nose of it, has cut exactly one mile. I'm just gonna make sure I did tighten this up pretty good. Oh yeah, it's pretty tight. Okay, because I'm just gonna do one power cut through, which I kept some paper for. Read that in a minute. And sharpen it up now, oh, and I want a 24 inch handle. I want leverage. Okay, so it's even though this is 10V gouge, it definitely is slightly dull. If I missed a bit of the wing. So I got it. And I don't, the heel's already pretty short. So a pretty short bevel on this, probably just under an eighth. Now, so what does a ball do when you try to when it's thin and you try to cut it with a gouge? What direction does it flex in? Away from the gouge or towards the gouge? Away from, correct. If you use a regular conventional scraper, which I didn't bring one, what does the ball try to do? Does it flex away from the cut or into the, into the tool? A conventional scraper, it feeds, positive feed. So if you were to take a big old, you remember the big old round scrapers you could buy from Henry Taylor and Sorby's years ago? I guess they still sell them. Anyway, those dinosaurs, you can still buy one. You can put it inside this bowl, and then you all get to share a piece because it'll blow it up instantly. I would say if you sharpen that the way they recommend, which is usually 70 degrees with a burr, yeah, I'd say it was impossible to cut the inside of that bowl. I mean, I'm not saying it. No, no, it's impossible. So what do people do? They tilt the chi skew on its side, the, the chisel on its side, not the scraper. So what's that called? So it isn't shear scraping. Mm -mm -mm -mm. It's negative rake scraping. It's a form of negative rake. You took the plane that the bevel is running parallel to and altered it. That's negative rake trailing the bird. That's why it doesn't grab. But problem is you've got to keep it balanced while swinging on an edge, setting on the corner of a tool. Hence, negative rake scraping. You just use something like that with a second angle on it. And you just keep it flat. Now you don't worry about all that BS that goes with like, you know, trying to keep it up like this and balancing it and well, it's shaking. And then, you know, you just drop it a bit and bang, it goes in. Whereas this, you just like stick it in and it goes back and forth. So what does this one do? If one pushes it away and one pulls it in, what does this one do? Doesn't do either. Correct. It's just neutral. I'm not saying you can't make it flex if you push hard enough. Yes. But then you're not supposed to push with this. It's not, it's not scraping. It's abrasion. So we'll talk a little bit about this in a second. But I'm running out of time, so I need to zip it and get on with it. Okay, so you can already see the ball's not warped, but it, for some reason it's not running true in the chuck, and I have no idea why, because the chuck's running true, so something went wrong. It doesn't matter. We can fix it. Okay. Notice I don't use cur curve to rest, and I do not put the two rest inside, because it is not going to help me. Hopefully I can pull this off, because there's a nice big gnarly knot in the middle of this piece, so we'll see. All right, so slightly undercut, so I got to come in with my bevel, slightly undercut. I'm going to cut really slow, folks. I have to cut really slow. The piece is quite harmonic. So I have to cut slow just to stop the harmonics. So I'm going really slow. Uh, definitely a harmonic there. Uh, by cutting slow, I can keep that harmonic to a minimum. Sorry about the volume, guys.
at that knot. I'll stop at that. So that knot, you can really feel it. Okay, so I've got a really nice clean cut and then I'm a little bit over an eighth. That's kind of been a chicken today. I wasn't sure what that knot was gonna do, but it cut real clean. So, as I was saying the other day, it's been seven years since I've blown a ball up in public. And hopefully it'll be another year before blown up. And it wasn't actually seven years, it's actually been 17 years, but Mike Mahoney caught me out one time where I blew a ball up on a jam chuck because I was using a piece of quilted maple of his that was worth like 500 bucks. And I use it as a jam chuck. So he was like, he was super upset. And the ball had a crack in it already at the top. So when I reversed it and put it on his jam chuck, he said, you can't get any more off my, my maple blank. That's for a platter that's worth 500 bucks. So I kind of squeezed it on and made the crack a bit bigger. And when I switched the lace on, it blew up. So that's classified as blowing up a ball, but I didn't blow it up by going through the side. I just blew it up by being sloppy. So, well, actually, don't steal somebody else's blank for a jam chuck. All right. Okay, so let's use a bottom ball gouge here and get that flattened out. By the way, this piece of wood is starting to crack, even though I've made it super thin. It is already starting to crack. Did I pass that bottom ball gouge around? Yeah, I'll pass this around. I've got a sharp one here. There you go. Oh, really? Oh, man. It was already cracking then? It's getting worse now. Hmm. Oh, well. Hope it now that it's thinner, it won't go any worse. I just don't want it to pop uh, when I jam chuck it. Okay, so here's the bottom ball gouge. There's look at my position, finding the end of the cut. Now remember, it's going to kick it a little bit here. And I got it. There's that kick as it tries to find the cut, but there's no bevel support on the initial start. Then it gets easier. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to take the speed up just a tiny bit more, because the middle, remember, the middle is going a lot slower. I'm being aggressive here because I just want to get hog it out. And then now I'm going to go for a final cut. You can hear it's warping. You can hear the clicking and then the clicking is gone. Too big a cut for this length of handle. I could do a slightly longer handle. So I'm going to take it in two. There we go. One. And pick it up. Just too big a volume. I could have done with slightly longer. One more finish cut, but this time light. And I'm not getting the finish quite I like there. So I'm just going to bring this in just a fraction, not too much because it doesn't benefit too much. And I'm going to give this a quick sharpen because I'm not sure I did sharpen this guy before. So I'm going to do a little cheat on the sharpening. What I'm going to do, that's a 40 degree. That's my relief angle. I'm going to lift it up and I'm going to sharpen it a little bit duller at more like 60 because it was at 55 before. I'm going to make it at 60 because there's a little bit of crazy grain in there. You can see the figure in there. And it's lifting up the grain. So by going slightly duller, it makes the cut a little bit harder, but it's less likely to pull out the short grain in there. So going in here, and I, I'm going to go really slow. You won't want to pick up the cut so early. There it is. Slightly lighter cut. Yeah, that's a better cut. So this particular piece of wood is preferring the slightly duller angle across this. I can hear it clicking though. That's indicating to me there's just some crazy grain in there and it's pulling it out, but hopefully not enough that it wouldn't come out. So remember when you're going across side grain, if there's end grain there, it's pulling at the end grain. Uh, it's not too bad. One more, I'm gonna go slightly lighter, slightly lighter. I'm not going to blow through because I'm not there yet, but I'm going to go slightly less material, slightly slower. I'm just being even nicer to the wood. The nicer you are to the wood, the nicer back. So look how nice I'm being to it. Just small, very small volume. Remember, this is not the 40-40 grind. This is the bottom bowl gouge. So this is affected by volume. The 40-40 gouge doesn't care. Ooh, a little bit in the middle. It's getting stuck on the paint on there. There's a little notch in there. There is it. That'll do it. Okay, but let's just show you negative rig real quick. 
because I need a, I need to finish off. So right now this would be ideal for sanding. So I've got no no major tool marks. I can't feel any major bumps. There's a few tool marks in there. Just some a little bit of there's a little bit of flex on this tool. Look how long the fluid is. It's too long, so it's flexing a little bit. But that would be sandable. But let's just show you how negative rake works. I already pre-sharpened it. So I just sharpened it, you know, on this, this side wheel here to put the burr on. This is a replaceable blade one. And no, they're not available at the present. But you can just make one out of an old skew, and that'll work just, just fine. So it's got a burr on it, and it has a negative angle. It's the negative angle, the secondary angle on the top that's keeping me safe, and you guys too, because um, you don't want me to blow it up. Well. Maybe you do want me to blow it up, but I don't want to blow it up. So, don't need that long a handle. I'll go over the 20, just on the safe side. Okay, so now the only thing you gotta be careful with negative break is don't go past center because it'll keep cutting and don't be aggressive with it and don't lift it like that. And I've seen it happen because people concentrate so much, they don't realize they're twisting their wrist and lifting it. So just keep it flat. Now I'm gonna use a paper. The reason I'm gonna use a paper is just because I've got to find the cut before I get going. And if that just puts a little bit of pressure. Remember, I can bend this with my thumb right now. So if I can bend it, then now it won't make it grab it. There you see, see how nice that is? Ooh, that's so nice. Now it's still be nice to it because if I take off more than the tool is capable of taking off without making the wood flex, now, if I was using a regular scraper in here, and those of you who have tried this before with a regular scraper, know that if you were doing this right now, you, you know, your heart would be in your hand because you're thinking, when's it going to blow up? Because it would be about to blow up. And let's just get the middle here. I don't need to support the bottom there. Get rid of some of those tool marks. Now, normally, I would not want to use negative break on something like ash or something like that. But if you want to reduce your sanding time or because ash has got the hard and soft soot growth rings, then this is worth doing in that case. But I wouldn't have to be sanding because of torn grain. I'd have to be sanding because I've got tool marks. And you see how much material it takes off. I mean, it takes off a lot, guys. I mean, that's a lot of material that's taking off the surface there without it giving me, ooh, that's really nice. I'm gonna go one more little bit down the bottom because a bit where the gouge had left some tool marks right there. Let's take that out and then we're done. I'm gonna use a paper back towel back here just till I find location, just so I don't, there it is. So you can see how reliable this is. Now I can't do this forever. This tool only has about maybe two minutes of cutting time. And then I would have to think about resharpening it. And I can make it all the way bottom. So why is this tool so effective at taking out gouge marks? Why is sandpaper not that effective at taking out undulations? So why does sandpaper and there's a little bump with that. It follows it. So when you're grinding a tool, why is a, why is a CBM wheel so effective? What does it do that sandpaper can't do? Doesn't, doesn't flex. So that's what negative rake is. It's a form of like CBN wheel, got a great aggressive grit on it, but it can't flex. So when it comes to a bump, it goes, oh, bumps in the way and just plows through it. It doesn't go, oh, bump, it's got to ride over it. So when you sand, because your sanding pads aren't made of steel, I mean, nobody would use a steel sanding pad, even if it's made of wood, then it'll just bounce on it, just bounces off. But because it's got the abrasive edge that's locked in, is it just goes and plows through it and that burr cuts it. Now, when you're on a side grain, it's technically scraping a little bit more. It's not relying so much on the burr on the side grain, you could still use a sharp chisel because it's just side grain, but it's using the burr up here. So it makes powder on the, si on the, on the side wall. And it'll make little bits of shavings on the bottom because in the shavings, it's technically scraping like a skew on its side. It doesn't dull it as quick, but on the end grain, it's definitely doing um, a form of abrasion. So let's flip this round and throw it on a jam chuck real quick. Oh yeah, it's really opening up. Ooh, yeah, they're not on there. But I'll pass it around for like a minute. So not everybody's gonna get to see it because I need to ch jam chuck it like real quick. I got a jam chuck it quicker. It's gonna split on as more as the case. Okay. That's it. Sorry, need it back. Like I said, it wasn't going to get very far. Oh, no, too far. <laughs> Mr. Carter, I'll get that back. Thank you much. All right, thank you. He's going to do what my dad did. He's just going to walk off with it. 
But I think I know Lee Carter for 35, 40 years. How long have I known you? 35, 35 years? You were, you were younger than I am today when I met you. I was probably, I think I was just in my early 20s, the first time I met at the Utah Symposium many, many years ago. Okay, going to put a quick edge on this guy. I got to speed it up a bit. I guess I should do both sides. And we won't need to make it a break. Okay, so I got to make, make it fit on a... Well, we've got to remove more than I thought, but we'll get that done. So I'm just going to kill this off real quick, guys. Ooh, I upset the lathe. Sorry about that. I stalled it. Okay. So we need to just... What was it? What did I do? I get the right size every time. You guys don't get the right size every time? It's not precise. It's close enough, you know. So actually, many years ago, uh, what was I making? I can't think what I was making. Oh, uh, oh boxes. So I was, I was doing a series of boxes. I was getting paid peanuts for these boxes. So I had to make them so fast. They're spherical boxes. But I had to make them so fast because this one gallery... In Oxford said, we'll take as many as you can make. Ah, this went a little bit. It's not tight enough. We'll take as many as you can make, but we're only paying you 30 pounds each for them. And that's for a spherical box, which is like 50 bucks. And it was not a good deal. And it cost me at least seven or eight bucks for the blank wood. But anyway, if I need a little bit of cash, I knew that this one place would always take them. By the way, I'm just using this, a negative brake scraper sideways here. And then I'm just going to take my fit. Up a little bit, get rid of that corner. Uh, anyway, so I'm making these spherical boxes. My dad comes in my workshop, and he, he makes me jump, you know, because I'm I'm uh, go for this precise fit. It's my first shot at the fit, and my dad comes up and he says, and he's like, "Oh, I'm like that," and 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 I'm like really cross with him, and I pick up the lid and it fits perfect. And I said, "What do you want, dad?" And he goes, "Whoa, that was good." I said, "What was good?" He says. That fit first time. I says, give me a break. That it fits first every time. But it was actually because I, I was cross because I thought I'd screwed it up because he made me jump, but he actually made me jump just the right amount. Okay. Is this secure? <sighs> what the hell? I blow it up. I blow it up. Yeah. All right. So I shouldn't make it too thin yet. I'll hollow out the base. So let's do a little pretty base. I'm pretty sure. It, I don't think it's going anywhere. Maybe it will. Uh, maybe it will. <clears throat> no, let's not trust it. It would be it'd be one of those times when I blow it up to like you know to save thirty seconds. It's just gonna get. So I'm just getting that wood out of the way. I'm gonna, I want my fit to be slightly higher up, just slightly tighter. Just slightly. Then I'll have a problem getting it off will be the problem, but, but I'm really nailing it up. Okay, now I feel confident. Can anybody remember how thick it was? What? I <laughs> know at the bottom. I mean, have I got a half an inch, quarter? Cool. I passed it round and 50 people can't tell me how thick it is. Because <laughs> I never checked it. I never got to see what it was. Oh, that's right. Only three. Yeah, oh, I didn't pass this one. Oh, yeah. Well, you guys can't remember? Four. How, how thick was it at the bottom? Yeah, I'll take your word for it. Perfect. That's what I needed. Yep. I know where I'm at now. Okay, so let's take off. Let's flatten up a little bit at the bottom. Remember, it doesn't give me a good finish here, but I want a slightly wider base anyway. And then I'm going to come in. Like I remember when you're cutting in here, this is 
just getting rid of volume. Then I need to get that a little bit below. I'm a tiny bit low. So it's going to do a series of little cuts in. The reason I'm cutting inwards just to get this down is that one, it's quite fast, but two, I'm going to then cut, cut the other way. Now, this is a cut that stresses the jam chucking because I'm cutting to the side of the jam chuck. I'm glad I asked Lee how much was there because he was exactly right. So I wouldn't have taken enough off, you see. Okay, so I think I'll flatten up a little bit more there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut all the way around to fix it. Okay, so now set my tool rest and see if we can make it to the top. But I'm going to be super paranoid. I'm going to give it a tiny touch up. Okay. And I'm just going to give it a little knock up again on the jump chuck. Because it's got some cracks in it. That's what's making me nervous, the cracks. <laughs> All right, see if we can pull this off. All right. There's the end of the cut. But it goes slow here. Ooh, it doesn't like the vibration. So I got to do it in two there. Okay, now I can take it out. I just didn't like the harmonics. Remember, wood is what we use for musical instruments. So you got to listen to the word, what it's telling you. We'll stop there. We don't go all the way. And we can pour it a little bit more at the bottom. So a tiny bit more at the bottom, and then we can call the day. So one more time around here. Got the grip wrong. I pressed on the bevel too much. You could hear it bounce. Change my hand grip so I could cancel it. Then we'll cut in one this way. Then we'll just do a quick negative break in two places. So what I'm going to do with negative break, I'm going to put the burr back on. On this guy, so it's just a square beading and parting tool. Let's use it in the bottom where the gouge didn't like to get in that corner too much. So, and just got a little few tool marks there. So just glancing across the bottom. So it's just a burr on here that I'm relying on the burr only. If the burr wears off before I get it finished, then I'll put another burr on it. Then across the bottom here, then we use the side of the chisel. The side of the chisel has a little burr on it to clean up where the gouge went down. Give me a really clean corner. And then I've got to use a negative break at the top here. Two spots. One, I got a little bit of a chicken out blip there. I got a bit nervous about the thickness. I'm like thinking, that's sounding pretty thin. And so I backed off a little bit, but let's just fresh burr on it because it only lasts a few seconds, especially a burr that's only, oops, not a lot of light here on my side of the lid. So a little high spot. Yeah, I got a little bit of a chicken cut there. And it's gone already, that burr. This is only three eighths wide. Normally, I'd like to use a one inch wide, but I didn't bring one with me. I forgot to bring a wider one. So it's just a little high spot here where I blipped with a gouge.
you can hear the bulls warping and then i've got just a little bit at the top where i couldn't cut all the way out because if i did i would have chipped the top so so i'm cutting from the top top down there we go there's a little bump but i'm not going to take it out i'll just do one more second with this and we'll pull it off it is broken yeah it's got a crack that's why i don't want to push my luck with it there's a crack right at the very top so I can't be too mean with it. That's why I chickened out a little bit with the gouge. I'm like, ooh, like I could hear it clicking. And that crack was definitely not there before. It's happened since I started turning it. But we can live with that. Come on. It'll come off eventually. Here we go. There we go. Oh yeah, there's a little bit raggedy at the top. And I would just stand up by hand, but I had to go through. But hey, running out of time. So you can see where it's starting to crack there on the knot. And then there's a, definitely a crack right at the very top somewhere it's split open. But to see off the negative rake and the tool, not too bad. It need, but we're out of time. So I think we're um, 442. Well, we are, yeah, I threw, I'm all, I've already overrun. But excuse the rim. I could just touch that up later. Or I just cut away my jam chuck and sand it. But Hey, you know, it's a uh, thin wall ball. Normally I would let it dry and finish it later. But on this particular one, I just went as far as I could, but we're out of time. Because he using a combination of 40-40 gouge, negative rake, bottom ball gouge. That's the result I get. So I don't deal with torn grain. There's still a skill level to learn with a 40-40. Anybody wants to learn to use a 40-40, I'm teaching class at the, uh, in Denver next, uh, next month sometime. I haven't set the dates yet. So I'm going to do a two-day... 40-40 class and bottom bowl gouge class. So if you're interested, I'll advertise it through the club. And then you can learn to cut like this. Quite a few of the guys in here have done this class before, so they, they know what it's like. It's a bit of a boot camp. You wear just, you turn, turn, turn for eight hours. I don't do much demonstrating. I just show you a cut, you practice it till you've got it, and we move on. Anyway, thank you for uh, being here tonight. I appreciate that. And uh, that's it for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>